All right, back for part two because when someone called me, it totally ruined my microphone. So I'm back now with sound, hopefully. As people come in, let me know if there's sound. And also, as you're all streaming back in, just a quick shout out for my, my little Q&A event I'm putting on on this Friday. If you're in South Australia this Friday and you want to join me for a Q&A in person, there's about 10 or so tickets left. I think eight tickets left now. So if you don't want to join me and you're in South Australia, go to the link in my my Q&A and join me in person. It'll be great to be able to meet you. Yeah, it's back. It's back. All right. The voice is back. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for letting me know there was no sound. Otherwise, I would have, I would have kept talking for the next bloody 30 minutes with no sound. That would have been fun. You just have to read my lips and see what I was saying. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for enjoying my content. I appreciate that. Trust me, uh, Vin in small su- bite sizes, it's nice. But if you, if, if you had me all day long, you'd get really bored of me very quickly. How are you all going? How, where are you all tuning in from? Let me know. Tell me. Let me know where you're all tuning in from. Just a quick check where people are uh, joining in from. <laughs> Thanks for saying I'm so handsome. A lot of people wouldn't think that, but thank you. That, that makes me feel better about myself. Are you going to change your hair color soon? Uh, no. No, I'm not going to anymore. It, uh, it burns my scalp. I used to dye my hair blonde all the time. And then I'd have to sit there for three hours while they bleached my hair and everything. And I did it for a period because it was fun. It was cool. But now as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 37 this year. And I just, sometimes I just, I don't know. I just, I'm just like, I can't be bothered. You know, I'd rather spend the three hours writing content, making videos, filming videos, spending time with my family, going camping. I just don't want to do that anymore. So there you go. Yeah. Oh, well, well, we've got people from all over the world. We've got a lot of people from India, a lot of people from Hawaii. Wow, that's cool. That's a, a lot of people from Australia too. That's amazing. Oh, thanks, Abbas. Oh, I thought the white hair looked pretty cool too. It's just different era of Vin now. I'm done. Ah, oh. Someone says, what, what was it like doing the video with Chris? Chris Doe, that is. Amazing. Doing the podcast with Chris was amazing. Chris Doe is, he's an incredible listener. And he, he's an incredible communicator as well. And, and more than that, I got to have lunch with Chris Doe. So I had lunch with Chris Doe when I was in Southern California. And we had, I had lunch with him and his wife. His wife's beautiful as well. And we had like a three and a half hour, nearly four hour lunch. So we were sitting there talking about life, talking about our businesses and talking about all the different ways in which we can collaborate moving forward into the future. And I'm just super excited. You know, I, I really didn't expect to be able to have this kind of influence online. I really didn't. I really didn't. Every now and then I just, I, I, I would just check my Instagram and go, do I really have over a million followers? Like, is it really 1.3 million or is it 1.3 followers? And it just, I always have these little moments of gratitude because I feel really blessed about to have this kind of influence. And, and it's cool because this is my own little corner of the world and I get to make the world better with this little corner of my world. You know, it's, it's just cool. It's just cool that I, I get to have that kind of impact and and have that influence. And, and I take it very seriously. And I try my best to, <laughs> for those of you who have me as a role model, I, I try my best to be a, a good role model for, for the younger generations. Sorry, I say it in that way because I feel old these days. It's funny because when my, my wife every now and then will be like, ha ha, you've got white hairs. And she plucks them out of my head. I'm like, don't pluck them, leave them. Because maybe one day I can just naturally have white hair. A question from In. In says, what are some tips for reducing stress on stage? Look, one of the most important things to realize is that being on stage is not a natural thing. So if you go on stage and you feel stressed and you feel anxiety and you feel nervous, please, first of all, acknowledge that that is completely normal. It is not a natural thing for you to be stepping up on stage and speaking. And one of the main reasons is that as human beings back in our early caveman days or, or our early human days, the only reason you would be in front of other people is because you were in front of your tribe and you were about to be convicted for something. 
right? You're about to be judged for something. They're about to probably burn you alive. So it's kind of programmed into our human evolution DNA that anytime you're in front of a lot of people, something bad is about to happen. So please, first of all, I would just relax and know that that is a completely normal feeling to be feeling. So instead of while you're feeling nervous, thinking the thoughts of, why am I nervous? Why am I anxious? I shouldn't be like this, which then sends you down a spiral of getting more nervous and becoming more anxious. Just acknowledge it and go, you know what? This is completely normal for me to be feeling this. It's completely normal. Step number one. Step number two, the feeling of being excited and the feeling of being really scared and anxious and, and nervous, it feel, it's a very similar feeling. So I, I reframe it. Instead of thinking, oh, I'm so nervous. Oh, I'm so anxious. I just think to myself, no, no, no. I'm actually really excited. And it's easy to misunderstand the emotions and confuse one for the other. So I kind of trick myself into, yeah, you're not nervous. This is just a feeling of excitement. You're actually really excited. You can't wait to go out there and serve the people in front of you. Again, so first of all, I acknowledge it's normal. I acknowledge it's normal. <laughs> then I reframe it from being nervous to excitement. And then finally, I get out of my own head and I go, you know, when I get out there on stage, it's not about me. It's about the audience. I'm here to serve the people that are in front of me. And one of the reasons we get really nervous is because we become too self-conscious. So instead of becoming more self-conscious and thinking about the self, I think about my audience and I become audience conscious and I think about them. And those three things help me immensely. I'm out, I'm out of coffee. I've got this last little bit and I feel a little bit sad to be honest. It's all gone now and I feel a little bit more sad. Juicy Parenting. I think we've exchanged DMs before. Juicy Parenting says, what are your thoughts on teleprompters? Teleprompters make me sound robotic. When you don't know how to use teleprompters well, then they can cause you to sound robotic. Because someone reading versus someone just talking, it sounds very different. So in order to use teleprompters well, you have to learn how to write in the conversational language for the teleprompter. A lot of people, when they type, they don't type out a talk that is in the conversational language or the spoken language. We tend to type the written language. And let me read to you what the written language sounds like. So I'm just going to read some, some writing on the back of a pen case. So if I, if, I, if I started reading like this and I said, for permanent labeling of almost all materials, for example, paper, card, metal, glass, plastic, and wood, chisel, nib, waterproof, quick drying, odorless, Tips are the best way to go about it. Be sure to use our refillable pens. <laughs> it sounds really like scripted and, 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 and written, right? So there's a difference between written language and the spoken language. So if you were to use a teleprompter, make sure you're typing out the spoken language. And for example, the spoken language is what I'm doing right now. What I'm doing right now, it's, it's all conversational. It's all spoken. I overall avoid using teleprompters where I can. I even avoided it while I was recording my online course. Just because the moment I had it, you could tell my eyes were following something and I wasn't really connecting with the camera. So for me, there's an art form to connecting with the camera. There's an art form to connecting with an audience and that requires eye contact. So if you're reading a teleprompter, you're removing one of the most important body language aspects out of communication. I would avoid it if possible. And if you can't, then make sure you're using the spoken language and not the written language. Vin, do you write scripts for your talks and or videos? Uh, yes, I write scripts for both. And then I practice them until they're all up here. So then I no longer need to look at a teleprompter. Good time for asking that question. How to make small conversations turn into big conversations. I love this. Well, it, again, I love this uh, quote of wisdom where they say, uh, the quality of your questions will determine the quality of the answers you get. So when you're doing small talk, ask small questions. Small questions can be things like, what do you enjoy doing in your free time? What kind of food do you like? Where would be a place that you'd love to visit? These are kind of smaller questions which give you smaller, lower quality answers. Or then you could ask bigger questions. Uh, what's, one of your, what's one of your dreams you want to be able to accomplish this year? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? What's your biggest value and why? And those lead to bigger conversations. 
And I think it's important to start with the smaller conversations before you go to the bigger conversations because if you just meet somebody for the first time and you ask them, what is your meaning of life? It can be a little bit too much or they may love it. You never know. However, if you want to play it safe, ask some smaller questions first, get the conversation going, small talk, and then small talk. If you want it to lead to bigger talk, then ask bigger questions. Small talk, small questions, bigger talk, big, bigger questions. Vin, how many languages do you speak? Three. I speak did you, Vietnamese and English. Vin, can you help me with a math test? Unfortunately, I'm not that kind of Asian and I can't help you with that. I do apologize. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I'm just looking at the comments here. Oh, whooper. Thanks for buying me the badges, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are you going to do your master classes on a different time zone for European countries? I know, I know, I know. Uh, I have a lot of European uh, students and audience members who are like, Vin, why are you doing them in the middle of the night for people in Europe? It's because a lot of my students are mainly from the USA and Australia at the moment and Asia. So that this, this time zone I'm doing is more Asia, America, Australia friendly. I'm definitely going to be doing a European time zone. So thank you for being so patient. It's coming. It's coming. Someone just said, Kath just said, well, it's Vin Live. It is, it is Vin Live. Thank you for joining me for the live. Thanks everyone for, for sitting with me and hanging out. You know, I forget how cool it is. You know, we've got so many people joining us live right now. It's so cool. It's like sitting in a room with just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. How cool is this? It's so special. It's so lovely. Ah, here's an interesting one. What do you do when you have a brain freeze and forget what you need to say during your speech? Pause and give yourself time and space to think. It's okay. Just like I'm doing right now and say, for example, now I got what I've forgotten and then I keep talking. Those pauses, you'll completely forget. The biggest thing you have to remember when you've forgotten what you say is if you don't make a big deal out of it, other people won't make a big deal out of it. So for example, even if I forgot what I was going to say just moments before in this video, by this point, you've forgotten about it. If I didn't call it back, you would have totally forgotten about it. Whereas if I made a big deal out of it, if I forgot what I was going to say and I go, oh God, I'm so sorry. I've totally forgot what I was going to say. Oh no, I've totally stuffed this talk up. Oh crap. Oh, you're all going to remember this for the rest of your lives until your children, aren't you? Oh, you know what? I'm just going to walk off stage. If you did that, then yes, that's all they're going to remember. Because if you make a big deal out of it, they will make a big deal out of it. If you don't make a big deal out of it, they won't make a big deal out of it. So in those moments where you forget what you're going to say, just take a moment, pause, breathe and recollect. And just remember back in the, you know, again, if you rehearsed well, you better remember it. So don't panic. Don't panic. In those moments, don't panic. Just pause and think back to what you're going to say. But then what's the best thing you brought this year or you purchased this year? What's the best thing you purchased this year? Ooh. I'm going to have to think about this. Hmm. <laughs> best thing you purchased this year. I like stuff. I do like stuff. Ah, I know. This year I purchased a new tent for my trailer. So I've got a, I've got a really big trailer and I bought a new rooftop tent and it's called a Bundatech rooftop tent. It's amazing. So I used to, I used to have this tent that was a fold out tent. So basically every time I get to the campsite, I have to fold out this tent. I have to put all these legs on it. I have to strap it to the ground. It, it would take me an hour and a half to set up this tent. Whereas I could be spending more time enjoying the scenery with my son, looking for kangaroos, looking for wild animals, and hopefully not seeing a snake. I could be doing that, but instead for an hour and a half, once we get to the campsite, every time we move campsites for an hour and a half, every single time I'm setting up the tent. And it's my job and my wife doesn't help me because she's like, you wanted that tent, so you do it. So then I have to bloody do it every time. So I got a new tent. So I got this one of these tents called a Bundatech rooftop tent where you just, all you do now is it's like a shell tent and you press a button and it goes, 
within 30 seconds, my tent is set and it's done and it's ready to go and I can go explore with my son. Hands down, best purchase ever. And again, the reason it's the best purchase ever so far this year is because every time I go to a new camping site, I go, I just saved myself one and a half hours. Just saved myself another one and a half hours. Just saved myself another one and a half hours. And that's one and a half hours to pack, to set it up and then one hour to pack it down. So I've already this year saved myself 20 hours of pack up and set up time. And I love those moves as I get older because I become more conscious that I'm running out of time and I don't have that much time to live. Even though people who are older than me say, oh, you're so young, Vin, you've got lots of time to live. But to me, I'm still, you know, there's that part of my brain that's slightly obsessive going, time is ticking, Vin. So anytime I can save, I want to save it. I'm weird like that. Moving on. Oh, Rena, you're asking the big questions. I love this. Rena says, what is your meaning of life? My meaning of life at different stages of my life changes dramatically. When I was much younger, my meaning of life was to find love. I wanted to find a girlfriend. I wanted to find a life partner. And then when I got a bit older, when I was in my 20s, my meaning of life at that point was to make money, was to create abundance, was to find a career that I loved, was to find work that felt like play. And, you know, it just keeps evolving at all times. And I allow myself to change the definition of my meaning of life at different eras of my life, at different points in my life, at different chapters of life. We should have different meanings of life, potentially. I mean, you do you. Maybe you have one meaning all throughout life. That's cool, too. But for me, I change it at different points of my life. And currently in my life, the meaning of life for me now is to collect memorable moments, doing things I love with people that I love. And that's my meaning of life right now is to collect as many meaningful moments and memorable moments as I can with the people that I love most. You know, uh, in two weeks, we're going to Sydney, my family and I, for a little holiday. And then after that, we're going to Korea. So we're going to South Korea. You know, and I'm, and I'm going with my wife and my son and we're going to collect lots of memorable moments. We've been really getting into some Korean shows and we've been seeing them eat all these yummy Korean food. And I was like, why don't we go to the motherland and eat Korean food from the motherland? So we're going there for about two weeks. And, and again, it's just prioritizing that over my previous definition of life. My previous definition of life was all about creating wealth and making more money. And that's all I focused on for... A big part of my 20s was my primary focus and I didn't do anything outside of that. Whereas now I, I, I want to not focus on that so much, you know, and, you know, it's still an important part of my business, but Vin, that's not, that, that's not your meaning of life at this point in life. This point in life is about memorable moments, collecting lots of those with people you love. And again, I'm sure at some point it's going to change. And I, I, I don't know what the next version of it is going to be. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out. Oh, here's a, here's a chat GPT question. Uh, do you think AI chat GPT will ever take away from speaking events? I, I don't think it can because how is it possible for AI at the moment in the next five years, how can it replace a person delivering content at a live event? I don't know. Maybe it can. I mean, I, I think it. I, I think we're safe from that for the time being, because I think human beings still value other human beings, and until human beings no longer value other human beings, then I think live events are still going to be okay. We, we're still going to want to go see Ed Sheeran sing. I don't want to go to a stadium and watch a computer play music. I mean, I, I don't. Maybe maybe there's a generation that will not care about that and be like, oh, we don't need the real Ed Sheeran. We got ChatGPT playing Ed Sheeran songs. Woo, let's go do that. Nah, I mean, I, I, I would still want to see Ed Sheeran sing. So I, I don't know. I don't really think that there's too much of a threat for that just yet. And I say the word just yet because I think things are changing fast. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to, to watch the content creator space as it's just changing so fast right now because you can literally go into ChatGPT and write... Write me a script on this topic and it just writes you a script. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Here's a question. The Obloat, the Obloat says, 
What's one way to encourage questions rather than simply saying, do you have any questions? And they respond either in silence in a group or all good in one-on-one -on -one situations. How to promote more questions. There's a very easy technique. Give people time and space to think of a question. This is what I do every time I do a presentation. What I do is when I've done my presentation and I want questions, instead of just immediately throwing it out to the audience, say for example, I've done a good presentation, I've done a wonderful presentation, and right at the end I finish, I go, and that's my presentation, everyone. Do you have any questions? Do you have any? Does anyone have questions? Why does everyone have questions? Raise your hands if you have questions. I guess there's no questions, we'll move on. Notice what I did there? Is I immediately assaulted you at the end and asked for questions. I didn't create any time and space for it. So what I do at the end of my presentation is, is I, I, I do this, I go, okay, that's the end of my presentation, everyone. Look, I'm going to give you all a good minute to think of any questions you have, whether you'd like me to you know, answer questions that can create more clarity. So I'm gonna, I'll keep time, don't worry. Uh, please, everyone, talk amongst yourselves. Give me a chance to go get some water and we'll resume for questions in about a minute. I give everybody a minute. And then it's amazing what happens after that. After that, there are multiple hands that go up, people ask questions, etc. The reason why people often don't ask questions immediately after a presentation is not because there's no questions, but rather it's because you didn't give them any time to think about a question that they wanted to ask you. That's it. And then at the end of that, if there are still no questions, I go, look, I'll just give you all a little bit more time to think of questions that might pop up. And while you're thinking of questions, I'll share with you the most common question that people tend to ask me after a presentation like this. So first of all, the question that people tend to ask me is, and then I start with a question that always gets asked and I warm up the audience. And generally by the end of that, it generates lots of questions. So multiple techniques for you there. Uh, Dave says, do you, do you psych yourself up with self-talk before you speak to a big audience? If yes, what's your routine? Yeah, I do. I do. I, the, the, the script that I play for myself, that I think to myself is that, Vin, there's someone in this audience right now today that needs to hear this message. And if you deliver it well, you have the potential to change that one person's life. Focus on that person and deliver it for them. And the reason why I think that to myself, just kind of quietly in my own head, is it helps me give my best performance. It helps me go, you know what, there's, there's going to be, and, and hopefully there's more people that I can change. But let's say, for example, there's just one. I'm like, man, if you could just change this one person's life with this presentation, that's amazing. And, and it helps get me into this really intense mindset where I'm, I go out there, I'm, like, I'm going to change this person's life. I'm going to do everything I can to add as much value as possible. And it just gets me into a good headspace. And I go out and I'm like, rah. I'm just scrolling through the comments, everyone. Uh, Landon says, do you have an online course? You know, I forget that there's new people joining me all the time. I used to feel really gross about telling people that I have an online course. And then one of my, my team members reminded me, they said, Vin, you know that there's five to 10,000 people that follow you every day that have no idea about anything about you. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I read this other, I read this other wonderful comment. Um, oh, I'm gonna have to jump out of my phone to find it, so I won't do it. But it was something like, great marketing is repeating the same message many times, not many messages once. Something like that. And I went, oh, okay, it's okay to say the same thing multiple times, because again, it's the things you believe in, it's the things you do. So with all of that said, I do have an online course, it's called the Stage Academy, and I've distilled over 10 years of my experience in the realm of public speaking, presentation skills, body language, storytelling, into that 10 plus hour course. Links in the bio. Welcome, welcome to, welcome to the world of Vin Zhang, and, and welcome to my little corner of the internet. Thanks for, thanks for dropping by. I'm going to Korea. Some people ask, when are you going to Korea? I'm going to Korea at the end of this month. So I'll be there end of April to early May.
thanks for all the comments, everyone. I really appreciate all the, the kind words and everyone being so, so lovely. So thank you. Thanks for being so kind. It's beautiful, you know. I, I think it's, it's so lovely that... Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just so beautiful that everyone's... So much love and kindness here. I, I, I feel very, very grateful, you know. Because sometimes, depending on which platform you go on... There's a, there's a lack of kindness, compassion, and love. It's beautiful to, to see this here, so thank you. All right, well, I'm just going to scroll down because I think, I think I've missed a lot of the current comments. So I think I'm no longer current. A lot of people are asking if I'm Vietnamese. Yeah, I am Vietnamese. I was born in Australia. However, my, my background is Vietnamese. Ah, interesting question here. I'm a funny person and I love it. But I also want to be perceived as a serious person and a manly person. What to do? Look, I think as human beings, we're multidimensional. You're not just funny. You're not just manly. You're not just serious. You're many things. You're deep. You're kind. You're compassionate. So I think we're, 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 we're multidimensional. In, and to, 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 to put ourselves in a box, I think, is a really limiting, limiting way to view ourselves. And, and think about this, right? How do people start... People put us in a box only when we put ourselves in a box. I mean, think about it. People only put you in a box when you put yourself in a box. If, for example, you all view me to be a nerd, well, why do you see me to be a nerd? Well, you see me to be a nerd, maybe because I see myself as a nerd, and maybe because I'm acting in a way that you would think of me as being a nerd, right? So if I act outside of that box, then you will no longer perceive me to be within that box. So I think it's, it's one of those things where that change starts with you and the way you view yourself. And if you start to see yourself as a multidimensional person, you'll start to behave in a way that will allow yourself to be perceived in a multidimensional way. For example, I mean, I like to think of myself as someone who has fun. My team members just sent me a, I just got sent some feedback today. I'll give you an example. I had someone, because I, I like to be silly, I like to have fun, I believe fun is, um, fun is one of my biggest values, and sometimes I have a lot of fun in my emails, and in my emails, I wrote that, oh, I just paid a whole bunch of people to give me uh, a, a video testimonial, these are real testimonials, but I just, I was just pretending that they were paid actors, and then this person sent an email and just said, hey Vin, I, I feel that you are being too silly in this email and it's taking away from your credibility and, and, and it's okay. It's okay. You know, some people will think that way and I'm not here to serve everyone. And unfortunately I wasn't able to serve that person in that moment because our values didn't align and that's okay. And that's okay. However, if I was serious all the time, then people would perceive me to be really a really serious version of him, but I'm not serious all the time. I'm a silly person. I like having fun. And I'm serious too. So I, I just kind of exhibit behaviors of someone who is silly, someone who's serious, someone who can have a deep conversation, someone who has, hopefully you believe to be what are good values. And again, I, I, I'm multidimensional and I can switch between them all. So for me, it starts all with, first of all, how you view yourself. And if you start to view yourself as being a multidimensional human being, you will start to exhibit multidimensional behaviors, which will then change the way people perceive you. Thanks for saying keep up the great work. Sometimes it's great work. Sometimes it's average work and it's okay too. Anthony says, I just want to tell you that your course helped me with my business and my personal life in terms of being able to communicate effectively. Anthony, that's so good to hear. Thanks, brother. Thanks for joining the Stage Academy and thanks for being a part of my online class. Vin, what is one resource for an aspiring business communicator and they must absolutely have in their library? Uh, I guess you're referring to a book here, my friend. I, I really love the book Blue Ocean Strategy. I really love it. And the reason why I love Blue Ocean Strategy is because it talks about how you, instead of as a business competing against other businesses, how to create new opportunities where there are no competitors. And that's why they say in that book, the metaphor is, why fight in the red ocean where everyone's fighting each other and it's filled with blood and that's why the ocean's red and you're competing against each other? It's kind of a horrific analogy if you think about it. Instead of the red ocean, go look for the blue ocean where there's no competitors. 
And I love that book. I love that book because it just keeps reminding me, oh, why am I competing in this space when I can go over there and there's no competitors? And that's really about how to identify your unique value proposition as a business and yeah, how to identify opportunity. It's a great book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Correct, Johan. Hello, Abhishek. Sup? Thanks for joining the live. G'day. Oh, there's a Q&A section here. Just quickly jumping back in here as well. Uh, Karish says, Vin, what is success to you? Success to me is... Success to me is when you leave the world better than you've found it. I've, I've changed my, I've changed my definition of success a lot. I used to think success is someone who has lots of money, uh, but I no longer kind of use that as my definition for success because there are people who have lots of money who leave the world a worse place than it is. And is that success? Not really by my books. My books are, my, in, in my book of definition, success is just someone who just made the world a better place. I don't know, it seems a little bit cheesy, uh, but again, it's my definition of success, cheesy or not cheesy. I just like that because it just means that lots of people can become successful. It doesn't mean you have to make lots of money, it just means you have had a positive impact out there in the world, in your community, in your family. It doesn't have to, have to be the world. It could just be if you, if you had a positive impact on your family and your, your wife and your kids today, you've been a successful person today, you know? I've simplified it a lot more. How do you know when you're ready to start a business or a new venture? You don't. Simple answer. You don't. There's no way, there's no such thing as being ready. I just, I, I've, I've finally come to be okay with that because I always think that in my life too. When's the right time for you, Vin, to, to go all in on this online strategy? Vin, when's the right time for, for you to no longer do as many keynotes and start to do more online presentations? There's no perfect time and you're never ready. You just have to do things before you're ready. And I just think that's the only way to do things. The only way to do things is do them before you're ready. Because this whole idea behind being ready, it's a bit of an illusion. There's a bit of an illusion there. How do you deal with regret? Learn from it. Extract the lesson from that experience that caused regret. Learn from it and do your best to not make that same mistake twice. And be proactive and try to live in a way where you won't create too many regrets in the future. I'll say one more thing. It's funny, right? I say all these things, yet I still make mistakes. And I'll be transparent with you. For example, I knew, kind of, that I didn't want to do more presentations and that many keynote speeches anymore. For example, even though I knew that at the beginning of this year, I still booked in a five-week tour doing presentations all around the US during March. Right? And I don't, I don't hate myself for doing that. I'm not that sad I needed to do that, right? Because if I didn't make that error, then I wouldn't have full clarity right now that I'm definitely not going to do that anymore. Five weeks away from my family was too long. Now, if I didn't do that trip, I would forever in the back of my mind be wondering, what if I should have done that five-week trip? What if I should still be doing tours? What if I, what if I should? What if I could? What if, and, and I would have all these what-if questions in my head. There are times when you have to make a mistake and it's okay because once you make that mistake, you get full clarity that you should never go down that path again. And that's the only way I was able to discover that clarity for myself is that I made the error and now I have full clarity that I'm no longer going to do that. Yeah. Look, everyone, thanks so much for joining me for this live session. I'm about to sign out. I'm about to head off and go spend some time with my family. I hope you all have a wonderful day. 
Thank you for joining me. And one thing I just wanted to quickly say here is that, look, I teach people presentation skills. I teach people public speaking skills. As you develop your speaking ability, as you develop your voice, your human instrument, your voice, I think the most important instrument in the world, as you learn how to use it, understand that there's power behind this voice. And every time you talk to another human being, I hope you'll use your instrument to spread more love, to spread more kindness, and to spread more compassion. I think in the world right now, we need more of that than ever. So please do use your instrument for love, kindness, and compassion. Thanks for being a part of my Instagram tribe. See you again soon. Bye for now.